Hey everybody, it's Kate. And Devin. This is Med Crimes. Med Crimes, what? Tuesday. Yes. For us, it's Sunday. Yep. <laughs> Listen, I just told Kate, so the promo photos that you'd have seen for this episode, I told her she had to heavily filter them. It's been one of those weekends. This is a day that I'm glad that we're like a podcast and not on camera job. <laughs> Thank the Lord. <laughs> I'm wearing a shirt that's got a couple of colored marks on it that I don't think is supposed to be there. And I'm not wearing real pants. <laughs> Are you ever? <laughs> I love me some leggings. We both enjoyed some awesome weekend uh, this weekend, uh, camping with our kids. If any of you camp, oh man, you know that it's fun, but that shit's a lot of work. If you've been listening to us since the beginning, like I was, I had said like how looking forward I was to camping oh, yeah, for the yeah. first season mm-hmm. with my family, and we absolutely love it. My children have the best time. Mm-hmm. It's just a lot of work. It is so much work. It's like having a whole nother household. And the fresh air is exhausting. (laughs) All that damn sunshine and damn sunshine and oxygen. (laughs) Birds chirping. (laughs) The fresh air that wakes you up so early in the morning. Where's my Is that the toddlers? Where's my Netflix? (laughs) (laughs) It was a good weekend. It was a good weekend. We're just exhausted and then we're getting ready for another full work week. Mm -hmm. But until then, like we get to spice it up and end our weekend on a high note, recording this podcast episode for y'all. We've got a good one for you guys today. I told Kate, sorry to interrupt you again, that I needed something really upbeat. Mm. But I mean, we're med crimes, so that's nothing's really upbeat. But I just needed something that was a little cray cray because Dr. Schneider twice was was exhausting so this one's not like wacky by any means but um i it's one that we can kind of not be so closely connected to and it's um like kind of old timey because i'm learning that i love these old timey cases because it's just so interesting to me the way the world worked back then the way the world worked yeah sounds like a tv show and we are going to be talking about the notorious hh holmes I'm sure you've all heard that name at some point. Devin's heard it. She's looking I'm, at me like I'm she hasn't. I'm silent because I'm thinking. H.H. H. Holmes, man. I don't know. God, it's another area where I'm probably stupid. I mean, no, you're not stupid. Most people... You, I'm just if really I talk, tired. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you just need to wake up. That's all okay. good. Okay. H. H.H. Holmes. Triple H. <laughs> That's a wrestler. <laughs> I heard I'm also related to him. Oh. Oh. One of those, like, distant relatives this really took a turn yeah anywho um (laughs) so hh holmes hh holmes was an american serial killer and con artist who faced charges including insurance fraud check forging swindling bigamy theft and murder nothing's triggering a bell yet so he sounds um, like a douchebag yeah oh he's of the highest order he certainly is um and there are legends sort of regarding his murders which describe a murder castle which we will, we will dive into a murder castle a murder castle where does it exist where's the castle chicago oh yeah I'll it's actually really interesting there. so so he had nine confirmed victims and he confessed to 27 he may have killed as many as 200 though what? That would be like at the very, very top estimate. Throughout what time span? Um, a few years. Okay. <laughs> That's a lot. I know. I am going to preface this by saying Holmes had written sort of like a memoir about his life and crimes. And he wrote it about himself? He did. After he, much? After his, well, it, it was after his like arrest and conviction. And this was him, you know, apparently like admitting to all of his crimes and like confessing to how he did everything but in it he claimed to kill many whom were later confirmed to be alive 
like he said, oh. oh, like I killed this person, and then like they went and found that person, and they were like, no, 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 nobody killed me. I'm I'm still here. So what? Some of what he admitted to was obviously greatly embellished, and obviously not all of it was true, but some of it was confirmed to be true. So. A lot of what we go off of here is his account because only he knows like the details of how he did his things to people. Um, but just, so we don't really necessarily know if it's true. Exactly, we know he, that he seems to be a fabricator. Exactly, there's some things that are obviously embellished and fabricated within this story. He is the fabricator. He is the fabricator. He's definitely that, and a lot of you things. said it's old timey. Yeah, how old. Um, th so this is, he was born in 1861. So a Ooh. lot of this took place in like the, um, 1890s, around the 1890s. He was in his 30s. Yeah. And like this us. was like a really, um, interesting time in the United States. And, um, this is definitely going to be two parts because there's a oh. lot to unpack here. Okay. Um, I'm going to start, you know, we're, we're going to go through sort of the, the time period. We're going to set the scene a little bit. And talk about, you know, how he came to be in Chicago and sort of the beginnings of his actual shenanigans. And then in part two, we're going to get more deeply into his actual shenanigans, his arrest. So I might not get as angry right now. No, probably not as angry. I mean, he definitely did some shit. He did like some shitty stuff. Some shit. Some shit. Some shite stuff. And it's interesting because what makes Holmes really interesting is that... Most serial killers, you know, they, they kill to, like, satisfy an urge, you know? Um, like, they have this need or this, like, you know, requirement to, like, kill, you know, kill in order to, like, keep themselves going. And typically serial killers are not, like, working off of some kind of motive. But for this guy, the motive was always financial gain for, for pretty much mm -hmm. everything that he did. So it was really interesting. And so... Um, and I'm sure you're going to get there. Mm -hmm. But my first question is, this is med crimes. Mm -hmm. so what profession was he in? He um, what is often referred to as Dr. H.H. H. Holmes. Okay. Although he never was licensed as a physician, he went to a medical college and was a... He worked with a lot of renowned anatomists and studied with a lot of anatomists. So he's basically an anatomist. Do you have to have your PhD for an anatomist? Like, is he, you know? So I don't know. What I Especially found is that he spent four years at um, a medical college, and that was his only four years of, like, college work. But okay. I don't know what the requirement was back then. I know that he was not a practicing physician. Got it. But he is referred to as Dr. H.H. H. Holmes in Dr. many of these publications. So. Okay. Um, I and it, he studied medicine. He studied under these anatomists for like a long time. So, a lot of what he did was um, all medical in nature, and that was his big field of study. So it's funny. He, you know, that he he killed in this way that was always a financial. You know, he always had a plan financially how he was going to benefit from somebody dying, and for any criminal activity that he partook in. And he was truly like a career criminal. <laughs> like it was so multifaceted what he did. He was not just a killer. Like most serial killers, you know, they es there's a pattern of escalation and then they like kill. But this was really. I mean, he he did anything and everything to break the law, and or as long as it gave him financial benefit. Okay, it's crazy. Yeah. Very ambitious guy, extremely ambitious. So, Holmes was born as Herman Webster Mudgett. Mudgett. Yeah, and he was born in Gilmanton, New Hampshire. Whoa! I never. <laughs> That's not far from here. I know. Wasn't that interesting? I'm putting a, fate, I'm putting a location with mm -hmm. the story. I never knew that he was a New Hampshire native until I started researching this. He's like a notorious guy. So he was born in Gilmanton, <laughs> New Hampshire, May 16th, 1861. His parents were Levi Horton Mudgett and Theodate Page Price. Wait, he, Levi Horton Mudgett? Yeah. It was getting better and better. Dude, these some of these names, we're going to talk about it, but some of these names are like a lot. Also, mm -hmm. his mom's name was Theodate. <laughs> Did you, did you hear that part? <laughs> he was the last of three. Um, he had one older sister and an older brother, and they were a devoutly religious farming family. So he worked hard as a kid. Um, 
later when people started like really investigating Holmes and were sent to interview his parents and his family, not one friend or neighbor had a single bad thing to say about his parents or his siblings. Some neighbors, though, did say that Levi, his dad, loved money and he was very open about it. And he was someone who would do whatever he could to get ahead financially. And some neighbors actually reported that at times he was like dishonest in his business practices. So Mm -hmm. I wonder if this was sort of HH's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Holmes is kind of first rodeo with that. practice. Yep. Per report from his siblings, parents, and friends, there were no concerning behaviors from his early life that would have led anyone to be concerned that he might actually be a psychopath or a sociopath. <laughs> like he never, you know, what he you see. He seemed like a normal kid. I don't know how he got to be a psychopath. Isn't that interesting? Well, I mean, a lot of kids will, you know, hurt animals, start right. fires, like do the little kid shit. The that's... death art books. Yes. Yes. The Swango the... method. Yes. There <laughs> No, there was no swangoing here. He did not swango through his childhood. So um, he was apparently never abused either, which is another common finding. Um, And he did state in his writings that he did fantasize about death, though, like at an early age. And he would um, in particularly fantasize about his parents dying. What? And he actually was quoted to say, quote, I fantasized about watching their bones smolder and crack in the flames. There's a sign. I, I mean, mean, right there. Yes. Like, exhibit A, mm-hmm. you, you don't need any other exhibits. Like, okay, you're not behaving weirdly, but, like, when you say this shit... I that mean, makes me just a little bit concerned. I don't know that he ever, like, told anybody about this, though, like, until, like, now he's admitting it after all these crimes have happened. He's writing it in his memoir. But also, who knows if that's even, like, true. This guy... You know, there's a lot of what he says that is true, but a lot that has been found to not be true. Poor Theodate. <laughs> Poor Theodate. <laughs> That's right. Poor Theodate. <sighs> um, now, there was an incident that he wrote about as a young boy when he was in a pharmacy. And um, there was a skeleton there on display, like a human skeleton. They would do that, I guess, in pharmacies back in the day. Um, and there were some bullies. Because sure, why not? No, why not? There were some bullies there that, like were antagonizing him and I guess like pushed him into the skeleton and he fell into the skeleton. (laughs) Devin's actively laughing at this. When you are like six, that might be terrifying, Devin. I'm sorry, I didn't realize you said he was six. Yeah, he was like a little boy. I'm picturing this as a teenager. No, no, no. He was not like an adult Okay, no, now I feel bad for him. Yeah, okay. He was like a little boy. Um... (laughs) And so um, they pushed him into the skeleton to, like, freak him out. And initially, I guess he was, like, really scared. But then he just remembers looking up at the skeleton and being fascinated with, like, the intricacy and, uh, you know, of all how the bones fit, you know, the joints and with anatomy Anatomy. as, you know, a whole. And that's (laughs) sort of where he thinks his fascination with anatomy kind of came from. So... He grew up in New Hampshire, and he actually graduated from um, Phillips Exeter Academy in Exeter, New Hampshire, at age 16. He graduated early. Oh, wow. Um, And that's a good school. It is an incredible school, even now to this day. It's a great school. Um, And then from there, he actually took some teaching jobs at nearby schools. Um, He got married pretty young in 1878 when he was only 17 years old at the time. But I guess that was not unusual. I mean, yeah, we know that about old times if they get married young. Mm -hmm. And he married um, Clara Lovering. And the couple actually had a son named Robert in February of 1880 who was born in Loudoun, New Hampshire. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. Go Um, NASCAR. Holmes did leave his home state eventually, though, to pursue a career in medicine. And he did remain married legally at this time to Clara, even, and then Clara even went with him when he traveled to schools so that they could all be together. So, like, Mm -hmm. he would, like, you know, stay in a tenement house or something and have Clara and the baby with him so that they could all be together. Um, And he started out, actually, at UVM, University of Vermont in Burlington, Vermont, but he wasn't really impressed with the program there. So, a year later, he stopped UVM and he transferred down to University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and surgery. Now he's out of New England. I know. He's out. Now, 
Um, during school, he was anxious to like work and develop his craft and even apprenticed in the anatomy lab under the chief of anatomy at the time at that school, um, whose name was William Herdman. And there were some rumors that he and Dr. Herdman were engaging in like some shifty shit. So if you remember to when we talked about Burke and Hare, this is the 1880s. So anatomy is a budding science. Yes. There is a global shortage of cadavers. Were we having grave robbing too? Yes. So grave robbing and people stealing bodies and selling them, again, Mm -hmm. was common practice around this time. Not just an issue in Scotland. Exactly. No, not just Scotland. Pretty much every in every major city in the world Mm -hmm. where they were studying this stuff. And this was just... Um, rampant. It was everywhere. So there were rumors that he might have engaged in illegal purchasing of corpses that were known to have been stolen. Grave robbing, like he actually may have physically gone out and stolen some corpses himself to sell as medical cadavers. So at this at this time, the people that were robbing graves and like selling these corpses to medical schools actually like made a living doing this. Well, yeah, and, just like Burke and Hare did. Yeah, yeah, and they they were like, you know, that was like their primary source of income. And these two Holmes, I'm going to refer to him as Holmes. I know his name is not Holmes yet, but that's what I'm going to refer at him as during mm-hmm. this podcast. But Holmes and Herdman were said to have been like canoodling with these guys that were known career grave robbers. So um, Holmes actually later admitted that while in college, several times he actually used his cadavers to defraud insurance companies and collect their payouts, too. Um, So what he would do is he would like have, you know, a friend who he would approach his friend and be like, hey, you want to make some money? Um, And what he would do is they would obtain like a cadaver and they would try to to do this with like a, a heavily decomposed or like a burned cadaver so that they were unrecognizable Mm -hmm. and they would fake his friend's death using this cadaver and and tell the insurance company oh you know um using their friend's name like hey this guy you know died in a fire we need to cash out his insurance when that friend is still alive when that friend is still actually alive and then they would get the money and then split the profit from that when did this bite them in the back when like one of his friends is like no, I'm alive, dude. Well, that's well, that's the thing is like, like no when one's going to communicate. With their friends lives? And and the thing is like record keeping back then was yeah, probably not right. the best. So it's not like they're going to deactivate your social security number and then like you're screwed and you can't hey, like nobody. It's, I'm not dead. It's just one like lowly insurance company that's just going to give you a bunch of money and like nobody else hears about this death. So it's not like anything. You know these records don't connect and cross over like they do now. Wow. So it was kind of a kind of a scandalous situation. Scandalous. Scandalous. So Holmes had apprenticed in New Hampshire um, under Dr. Nahum Wright as well. And he was a noted anatomist in the area. He um, Holmes had done really, really well in school, passed all of his exams, finally graduated this four year medical college program in 1884. And he had later stated that White was one of his best friends, and the two remained in touch for years despite them having, like, a 40-year age difference. And that the two practiced dissections together routinely, and that he learned a lot from him. Mm -hmm. Um, Now, Clara and Holmes um, had often stayed together, like I said, in tenement houses with the baby during this period, but later... Housemates who had stayed with the couples would report that Holmes was occasionally like yelling and could get violent with Clara Aww. at times. Yeah. Eventually, she actually took Robert, the, the little boy, back to New Hampshire. She's like, I can't do this anymore. So she had left him and gone back to New Hampshire. And um, around this time, um, he actually left Michigan also and relocated to a place called Moore's Forks in New York. And from there, she, Clara says, I had no contact with him at all since then. So wow. she was left to raise their kid all by herself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So while in New York, it's worth noting that there was a boy that had gone missing. And Holmes was rumored to have been the last to be seen with this boy. And I don't have a lot of details because there's nothing really connecting the two but i but i found it in several different articles that i read that this was like a possible victim situation so um 
he was apparently rumored to have been last to have been seen with this boy. And the boy was not seen again after Aww. these, after Holmes was seen talking to him. And Holmes had told um, authorities and a couple of people that were like asking around town about the, what happened to this boy that, oh yeah, you know, I talked to him and he said he was going to go back home to Massachusetts, home to Massachusetts, which like we were, everyone was like, what does that mean? Right. But apparently he didn't even have family there that they could find. And like, he never made it anywhere to Massachusetts that they Random. could ever find. And he was literally never seen again. Um, so Holmes. How old? We, I don't even don't know. know. There, no, there was nothing just released. Assumption. Yep. Yeah. Um, and then Holmes, right yeah. after this, leaves town. He takes off from that little town in okay. New York. Suspicious. Little suspicious. Um, now, next, he ends up in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And there he kind of <laughs> jumped from job to job. The first one didn't last real long. He was an orderly in a hospital and he, he just like was transporting patients and like doing kind of the grunt work, but he hated it. So following that, he took a job at a drugstore in Philadelphia. So while he was working there, a young man apparently had ingested some cold medicine that was compounded by Holmes at the pharmacy and died shortly after. What? So... It's not known if this is really a suspicious death because was it I don't an know accident? how much it w- could have been an accident. Were there practices back then on exactly. like checking that? We don't know. And like, did he follow directions? Did he take way too much? Like, did he have? Did he a, have an unknown allergy? He could have. He, he could have had a medical event. Like, yeah. we don't know. He could. There could have been an interaction. There. We don't know. There's a lot of variables here. So please, you know, take this with a grain of salt. But. This death at the time was looked at as being suspicious because, you know, and I don't know. Yeah, Yeah. there were reasons for it. So um, he Holmes immediately denied, you know, having done anything on purpose. But again, right after this, he immediately leaves town like you're wicked suspicious. I'm sorry. And then it was from Philadelphia where he finally ends up in Chicago and Chicago is like where shit goes down it's where it's at it's where it's at for this guy so he now changes his name to henry howard holmes upon arriving in chicago which is again kind of sus Lonely, suspicious. <laughs> so we're gonna talk a little You've bit now about job hopped home hopped and changed your name and two people have like kind of suspiciously disappeared. disappeared or died like after having had contact with you so let's talk about Chicago around this time. So, it's weren't a, there like mega fires? Was so it around this time? shortly after this, there were, and we're going to talk about like the build up to all of oh, okay. that. Okay, after this time period. Yeah, so okay. it was after that, and um, it's it's interesting that you said that. So, it's important to note that around this time, which is the end of the 19th century, the city of Chicago is like this blooming area. Right. And it was the time of a lot of new construction. And what they were doing is taking a lot of the stone buildings, tearing them down and making wood structures. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of obviously what contributed to the fires after. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, And this was actually around, this was the time of, this was the birthplace of the skyscraper. And this was when skyscrapers, yes. And this is when this was all happening for the first time. And Chicago was really like, you know, innovating architecture too and you know the big city Mm -hmm. style of living um so there was a lot of a lot of changes and chicago was actually regarded as one of the more settled and modern cities in the country and as a result travelers were arriving like in troves and Mm -hmm. there were these new train systems and um everybody was frequently just like blowing through the city just to see what what all the buzz was about or to also be a part of it and like exactly obviously there's employment opportunities exactly so there's a lot of people going there and the city itself is just like growing and thriving and this was also around the time of like the birth of female independence so women like young women who were unmarried would like you know start traveling around like Mm -hmm. spreading their wings and flying a little bit that was now becoming a little bit more normal so we're also getting a lot of like young single women who are traveling alone coming through the city which is important yeah so sounds um, like it's set up for disaster honestly so um with Chicago really being on, like, the revolutionary forefront, this is why it was chosen for the location of the World's Fair. Are you familiar with the World's Fair? 
I have heard of it. Yes. I had heard it. I had heard like the term a bunch of times, but I didn't really like really know what it was all about. The World's Fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there had been a few World's Fairs prior to this, but. I have heard of this. Yeah. So, um, and we'll talk about like what the World's Fair is in detail, but um, it's also important to know that there was a lot going on, you know, not just in Chicago, but in the rest of the country and the world at this time. So this is post-Civil War time. Um, again, anatomy is this new and budding science okay. and medicine in general is changing very quickly, very drastically. Um, there's also, this is also like a big time of transition between frontier America and like modernized America. I was going to say early 1900s, like, aren't we starting to get into a little bit like automobiles? Yes. And, so yeah. like there's such a technological revolution right. happening and that's a huge part of what the World's Fair was all about. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a lot of change like going on now, like everywhere, like not just in the U S but everywhere. And, um, in addition, it's important to note that Jack the Ripper was active in his killing pattern oh. around this time. And, um, there's even a theory that's floating out around there that Jack the Ripper was Holmes or an associate of Holmes. Oh, really? It's pretty far fetched. We, you know, if, if I really look into it, I'm not really all that convinced, but I can see why some people might think that. That Jack the Ripper is this, is this dude? Did yes. they ever find out who Jack the Ripper really is? No. And oh. there's a lot to unpack in that whole theory. I'm not really going to get heavily into like the theory here. And I encourage you to look into that because that is all very interesting. And side note, I think in the future, I would love to cover Jack the Ripper on this podcast because the crimes are, are, you know, he's thought to be somebody who was an anatomist or extremely familiar with anatomy because of how brutal and gruesome and surgical the crimes were, like literally surgical. It's Similar fascinating. Similar to like... Um... When you were telling me that we should do the story of the Black Dahlia. A hundred percent similar. So yes. it's similar to like that. Yes, absolutely. So yeah. um, I think we will, but I'm not ready. <laughs> it would be a long, a <laughs> long case and um, a lot of episodes. And it, it, it's fascinating, but like, I'm not ready for that. That'd be a lot. We'll Maybe get there. we'll do that in the wintertime yeah. when Kate and I are not camping. Yes, when we are not <laughs> camping. <laughs> we have like a lot of time to just really read all the best books about it and right. get you the best information. So Holmes meets and marries someone named Myrta. Myrta, I think, Belknap. Oh, has, yeah, yeah, yeah. But has he had a legal divorce? No. Hence so he's still, bigamist. so at this point, he's still legally married to Clara and mm -hmm. he meets and marries his second wife, Myrta Belknap, in 1862. Yeah. And again, never finalized a divorce. So he's married to two ladies now. Hence the bigamist. Hence the bigamy charge. I'm going to use the word hence. hence. So Holmes then went on to have another daughter with Myrta, Lucy Holmes, who was born in 1889. Now, Holmes was like, a ladies man no kidding like he he was as cunning and as shrewd in his like uh lady dealings as he was in his business <laughs> dealings like he the lady dealings the I like lady that. dealings <laughs> He was extremely charming. He was very good looking. I mean, like, if you look at home, like, pictures of him, he was, like, a mustachioed, like, top, like obviously, like, top hat and, like, you know, ascot and, like, all, all the, you know, trimmings of the time. But, like, a good looking guy for that time. Like, distinguished gentleman. Women, like, flocked to him. He was very manipulative. He had, like, multiple side pieces, like, at any given time. Um, and Murda, in particular, was very jealous of all the attention that he got from women. Like, no he kidding. Like, he did not hide it, like, very because, well. Because, you know, wives are typically okay with this. No, I know. Right? Right. So, while Holmes studied medicine and apprenticed with noted anatomists, he never, like I said, never became licensed or practiced as a physician, but... What he did do was operate a couple of pharmacies. And apparently this was common practice for somebody who had gone to quote unquote medical school and studied medicine for a period of time would, would mix drugs at a pharmacy and be known, but like give pharmaceutical advice to patients. That was like a thing that could happen. So you could be unofficially a pharmacist if you did that. Yeah. So, um, officially unofficial, officially unofficial. 
So he did continue looking for work in Chicago, and he did find a position for a pharmacy run by a man named Dr. Holton and his wife Elizabeth. Dr. Holton, similar, was a doctor, not practicing physician, but was running a pharmacy for that same reason. Now, his employer later reported that Holmes was great, and he was a hard worker. He was so smart. He was so helpful. Now, Dr. Holton and his wife were actually two people that Holmes later claimed to have murdered, but this was untrue. Um, because... Fake murdered him? Fake murdered him, yeah. So the two actually survived throughout, like, his conviction and his trial and survived well into the 20th century. And what actually happened is that... The, they all worked together for a time, and Holmes actually procured the pharmacy from them by purchasing it from them. Mm -hmm. And he just then ran it on his own. The couple retired and had a great life. But there was no murder. What he had said in his memoirs or his writings was that, oh, yeah, I killed them and stole the pharmacy. <laughs> no, bro. You're just not that metal, okay? For once, you actually did something <laughs> honest, and you just got the pharmacy from them so that when they retired, like... You know, it exactly. doesn't have to be like and there are, fantasized exactly. takeover. You don't have to be quite that metal all the time. Um, <laughs> bro. Bro. There are other victims, too, that he claimed to have murdered, but then were later found to, like, still be alive or have been alive, like, past the point that he said they murdered them. So, but again, some of what he said was true. So, like, take that, like, what we uh, say like, here. Why? Why? I don't get it. Why I the think... fabrication? I mean, I, and I don't know, but again, he's so atypical, and I wonder if this is just, like, his last-ditch effort to being, like, a manipulative jackass who just wants to really fuck with people, you know? Or to make it, like, so you can't believe anything that he says. Exactly. Because you never know which part is true and which and part is not. And maybe that's him, like, just holding on to that last ounce of power because, like, oh. I know what really happened. Only I know the truth. Only But me. I'm going to give you all these lies. I'm going to give you these lies. Know. Exactly. Nobody will ever know. So, as <clears throat> such, there's a lot of lore, like, surrounding the H.H. H. Holmes murder castle. And it was it is known well as the murder castle. And... A lot of it is likely embellished and a little fantastical. Much of what he confessed, again, was found to be unsubstantiated, but some of it was confirmed by the people that helped him build this castle. So there's some stuff there that, you know, historians, modern historians are looking back and saying it's unlikely that his murder castle was, you know, in terms of construction and the layout of the, of the facility was probably not what he said. But the people that built it for him actually did corroborate what it was like in there. So it's interesting. So why is this the murder castle? We'll talk about it. Stay okay. tuned. So um, what happened was he ran this drugstore, right? And then there was a vacant lot of land across the street from him. And he said to himself, Self, I could make more money if I built a big old building across the street from me right here. I could continue to run this pharmacy. I could have retail space below on the first, it's going to be a big three story building. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a big retail space on the bottom where I'm going to open a second pharmacy. Mm -hmm. The second floor is going to be apartments. The third floor is going to be hotel rooms. It's not a bad theory. It's not, especially because everybody knew at this point that the World's Fair was coming to town. Right. And a big reason that he got investors for this project is because the World's Fair was coming People and everybody need needed lodging. a place to stay. Mm -hmm. And how the, how much the city was growing, he said, I mean, there's like a housing crisis because yeah. of all these people that are flocking right. to the area. I mean, it's not. No, I mean, it was no, smart. No, it is totally smart. Self. Self. <laughs> so... Before we get deeply into the murder castle, we're going to talk a little bit about the World's Fair and but what I all that means. Castle. I know. Don't worry. We'll talk about it. Don't worry. So it's off. So this was actually the, the actual term for it is the Columbian Exposition, but it's also referred to as the Chicago World's Fair. And it's often referred to as the fair that changed America. And it was held actually um, to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Christopher Columbus arriving. To the United States, to the Sail Americas. the ocean blue. I know. So this was a place for innovators, inventors, and entrepreneurs to showcase their latest and greatest. It spanned 600 acres. Wow. And 
Many of the staples of innovation that we still use and see today were first introduced to the public here at this fair. I'm sure. For example, um, the they- zipper. <laughs> The, How did we ever live without the, the zipper? The fucking zipper was introduced at this World's I Fair. Mean, and we still, still have only those. Ha- if we only still had buttons. I, mean, I, I know. Exactly. How would we live? I wouldn't know. I know. So <laughs> cream of wheat was introduced here. Cracker Jacks. This was, the, this was like a bunch of like snack foods that are still here today. Edison's uh, kinetoscope. And also people listen to the very first voice recording here. Oh. Yeah. The... F- the beginning of podcasting <laughs> right it's, yeah, it's so true yeah it is so true and look where we are now so the first ferris wheel was here too and it was like Aww. a huge freaking deal this whole mm-hmm. thing was a huge deal um so this was set to attract like thousands of additional people to the mm-hmm. area i mean everybody wanted to come and check this out so Again, this gave Holmes just this great jumping off point with investors when he was planning on building as so many people would need housing and hotel rooms. So smart. So smart. Mm-hmm. So we're going to talk a little bit about the building now. So he there doesn't w- sa- He's not a dumb man. Oh, no. He's incredibly smart. He is like so intelligent. Except for he killed a bunch of people. He just is a, is a, he is his own little brand of psycho, but he's a very atypical psycho. Mm. So there were some wild reports about the building he constructed and the layout being quite insane and sort of like a fun house of horrors. Um, My first own opinion about the layout is I would put the apartments above the hotel rooms. That would that's be smart. Just me. That would be smart. Hotel rooms would be second floor. Yeah. Anyway. So. I'm not an architect. <laughs> neither was he. <laughs> Um, so the problem with confirming, like really confirming that the murder castle was how it was, is that the building was gutted by a fire shortly after his conviction. Mm -hmm. Um, and we're going to talk about that in part two, but again, you know, he, he endorsed all of these weird claims about how weird it was in there. And although a lot of that was untrue and historians are like, uh. It's probably but this is was the not building, done. not the castle. This is no, the building is the castle. Like the building oh. is his murder murder castle. Oh, I'm sorry oh, if I was oh, unclear. Oh, oh. Okay, they call it. Maybe the murder you were castle. very clear, and it's just me. I'm. <laughs> it is a big <laughs> three story building. Yes, that okay. is retail I'm space. A castle. Yep, it's I know, and it's a retail space on the bottom, apartments in the middle, yes, hotel yes. rooms on top. It was referred to later as his murder, murder castle. castle. Okay. So he funded the construction of this massive building with a whole bunch of shady business deals, screwing people, people over, not paying any of his creditors Mm. and paying uh, people to do like all these odd jobs. So he'd, he'd like find someone on the street and be like, you uh, build a door frame over there. And like, they'd finish that job and he'd pay them and they'd go. And that's how he got a whole bunch of hodgepodge weirdness to right, work because you don't have the same person no. to make it smooth and exactly and it's the weird thing is too though that like the architect that was like general contracting this whole project didn't even have plans for the house no he is the only he sketched out the entire house and he was the only one that ever had plans to the house reportedly mm. Mm. So it said, again, not confirmed, but rumored that the layout was extremely confusing and intentionally so, and that there were weirdly angled halls, uh, doors, or sorry, halls with dead ends, stairways that led to nowhere, doors with only brick walls behind them. I've seen a stairway that leads to nowhere. I've seen, I mean, in a friend's house. Really? She's going to listen to this and be like, that's my house. (laughs) It's interesting. Really? I've seen one. So creepy. She lives with it. That's awesome. She lives with it. Maybe she'll let you come sometime. I hope she does. That sounds amazing. Um, I literally stared at that thing forever trying to figure out where it went. That is so crazy. Why do people do that? Why do people build that? It's Um, because we live in these 1800 homes. Right? That's so interesting. So um, there were also shoots like in, in many of the rooms that were apparently greased greased shoots Wait, that why were they greased they were <laughs> we'll talk about why they were greased were they trying to fit humans down the shoots so they needed a little like probably no yeah 
So it wasn't for laundry. No, 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 okay. it was not for laundry. Oh boy. So um, there were these chutes, and the, and they would lead to like different floors, and eventually down to the place, down to the basement. So here's where it kind of gets a little creepier. So the second floor, which contained apartments, also contained some spare rooms that were later called his murder rooms. Oh boy. And it's said that these rooms were heavily insulated. And there were efforts to, like, cover the seals around the doors and windows, like, to make them essentially, like, soundproof. Uh, um, and that many of the rooms were fitted with gas pipes. And that the valves, like, the gas pipes led all the way up into Holmes' personal apartment on the third floor. And he had a switch, like, a valve to the, to the gas pipe. Stop. So only he could control gas flow in and out of the rooms. Come on. Yes. So he could turn um, turn gas off and on at will, and he had a bunch of these valves like in a closet in his room. Apparently, I'm getting I know. disgusted. I know. So, um, and these rooms, these quote unquote murder rooms, were said to have locked from the outside, and that they had like peepholes, like they had like little why sliding. Wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they? Exactly. Now the second floor also had these chutes, which were greased apparently, and these chutes um, dumped right directly into the basement. Now, the basement contained operating tables. He also commissioned the construction of large vats, which he later said were used um, for the disposal of the bodies of the people that he killed, which he, what he said he did was that he dissolved these bodies in either acid or lye. What? Yeah. Uh-huh. That's Gross. I know. Um, he also had a large furnace installed, which approximately, approximately was like three foot by eight foot. And the construction workers that were putting this in were that like... a big furnace. It is big. Also a big building, though. True. Um, the workers were like, hey, what are you going to use this furnace for? And he reported... Burning these... bodies. <laughs> well, it's funny you said that because what he said was, oh, I'm going to use it for glass bending. Which apparently was a thing like in manufacturing back then to make curved glass things. You need I'm a big sure. furnace to do that. Um, and this is actually interesting because the workers <laughs> then joked, well, typically glass bending furnaces are like a lot bigger. Like you have to have room to like slide in these massive mm -hmm. things of glass. And um, somebody reportedly has said, this one looks more like a body-sized furnace. Like, oh, LOL. Dear. And Three then, foot by eight foot. Yeah, I can see that. In hindsight, mm. <laughs> that joke was probably like, mm, accurate. Oh, God. I know. He added a so, crematorium yeah, to his building. he kind of did. He kind of did. So it's a murder castle. He also was reported to have had an elasticity rack. Huh? Well, so huh? this is... This has got to be different than what I'm envisioning. No, it's not. You're envisioning the right thing. So it's like literally like a rack that you strap someone to and you crank it and it like stretches them out. Get... So this is what he said he had this for. This is kind of kind of like... I, I can't help but laugh. I, I know that he tortured people. I don't know people. if I want to hear it. He wanted to create a race of giants. <laughs> This is what he said, which I mean, he's an anatomist. I mean, so obviously this is the stupidest fucking thing ever. But obviously, please tell me nobody believed him. No, they I, I, right? I don't no. know if anybody believed him. Obviously, it was there so that he could like torture people. Like, <sighs> obviously, that's what it was there for. But I, I just can't believe he fucking said that. I'm gonna create a race, a race of, of giants. giants in my fucking basement. Oh my god. Okay. Was it right next to his body? I furnace? don't actually know, like, the exact <laughs> location. So... Huh. It sounds almost like some kind of creepy dungeon. I know. And then again... I'm, like, envisioning. Exactly. And then again, these recent historians have, like, argued against all of these structural things and, like, you know, like, that they were pretty much unsubstantiated. But... So, like, whether you choose to believe, you know, any of this is totally up to you. But this is what is, like, reported. And I'm this is starting to get why you picked this wackadoodle cray cray. You're welcome. <laughs> I knew you needed, like, a little what? bit of a something funky. So, another thing that he did was he purchased a large safe. It? He bought it on credit, never paid, just like, you know, pretty everything much everything else. else. Um, and he got himself, like, really into, like, a world of Apparently shit. Apparently they didn't have credit bureaus back then. Well, they didn't, but there was a lot of people wondering where the fuck their money was. I'm sure. <laughs> like, and he got himself into a whole world of shit for that. Um, so, he had installed this, this uh, big safe 
like sort of adjacent to his home office. And the safe was airtight and it was fitted with a gas pipe that again had a valve that fed directly into Holmes' closet. Why do you need a gas pipe in a safe? I mean, if you're going to slowly watch someone suffocate and no. die. No, no, no. Yeah. No. Yeah. So there was also a viewing port with like a window with like a thing that slid open so he could like open a little window and just watch Say it all bye-bye. unfold. Again, hearsay, but this is something that was rumored to have happened here. Again, creepy dungeon is mm-hmm. what I'm thinking. Exactly right. So there are some rumors that these OR tables, his operating tables in his basement, um, that he used for illegal abortions. Now, um, some do report that he had performed these routinely for women in the community and that some women went there for an abortion and then were never seen again. Oh, God. Um, Mortality was really high for abortions, like around this time, I'm because sure. they were totally unregulated. Obviously, yes. there was like no, you know, this was not a safe procedure to have. Um, so, you know, it's unclear. That's not really, you know, well substantiated. But again, that's a possibility of something right. that he used. Um, and it's really incredible, like how much sketchy shit he got away with in the moment. And how many people witnessed all this crazy stuff when it should have been like this huge fucking red flag. And everyone just wrote it off because he was a quote unquote doctor who ran a pharmacy. Um, For example, one of the workers in his pharmacies reported that he routinely requested large quantities of chloroform. He would get like 10 bottles of it a week. And what are you doing with it, sir? sir? What the fuck are you doing? Hey, boss. I don't care what you do for a living. Boss. What are you doing with 10 bottles of chloroform? One of the workers in the building actually recounted that Holmes confidently took him up to the second floor where he showed him a partially dissected body. What? And at the time, the worker said that he did not find it suspicious because, quote, Holmes was a doctor, end quote. Yeah, but... Yeah. I know. I Devin, I know. Hey I know. boss. <laughs> boss. Another hey boss. <laughs> boss. I know. So Holmes reportedly paid him $36 to take that body, uh, put it in a trunk, take it back to his place, <laughs> remove the remaining tissue from the bones, rearticulate all the disarticulated joints, and return the skeleton to him intact. First of all, that's not a good price. No. And the second of all, <laughs> hey, boss, I don't know if I should do this. It's at least worth 50. At least. <laughs> and then Holmes turned around again. There's got to be a monetary gain for everything he does. So Holmes then turned around and sold the skeleton to a nearby anatomy school for $200. Come on. So he, of course, made a great profit off of this. Now, and who is this person? We'll talk about it. Stay oh. tuned. Okay. So Holmes continued to be met with various lawsuits from past investors for non-payment, no construction costs he never covered, and super shady business dealings. He had multiple affairs, many with female employees, and there were many transient women that were like in and out. And it was interesting because it's a hotel. People would then say that as the hotel was up and running, even like in the throes of the World's Fair, that any time a beautiful young woman came in, came in and needed a room, there was always room. But if a man ever came in and said, "Hey, I need a place to stay," they Sorry. were all booked up. Yep, exactly. The vacancy so, for you. Yep, it's interesting how that worked. Um, the turnover among his employees seemed very high and it was reported that many women would like be like you know it's it it is kind of weird that this place is like so structurally fucked up and also have you seen the people from 2b in a while and then as soon as they start like talking about the weird shit happening in the murder castle They've been replaced with another employee and that person is gone, never to hadn't have, you know, quote unquote, gone back home and was never to be seen again. Now, shortly after construction finished and they opened up, um, 
a f you know, all these people were sort of slowly vanishing without a trace, like we talked about. So we're going to talk about his first presumed victim, um, who was a mistress of his. Now, um, her name was Julia Smythe, and she was actually married at the time. Um, her husband's name was Ned Connor, and the two had a daughter together named Pearl. Now, they had taken an apartment in Holmes's murder castle and were paying rent on it. Now, Ned started working in the retail space below um, in the pharmacy that he had just opened up. And soon, Ned finds out that these two are having an affair. And he quits his job and he moves away, leaving his family behind. Um, and she, you know, Julia continued to see Holmes and the relationship just kind of continued from there with the two of them. Now, Chris big mistake, big mistake. So Christmas Eve of 1891, Julia disappears and is never seen again. Um, according to eyewitnesses and other renters, um, from Christmas Day on, the apartment that Julia and Pearl were in was completely unoccupied. But it wasn't like they had moved out. It was just that the people living there had disappeared. Like, for example, there were unfinished meals and dirty dishes, like, still on the table, completely untouched. Like, someone had gotten up and left mm -hmm. mid-meal. Mm -hmm. um, personal items were still there. The beds were unmade. There were a lot of ladies' toiletries that were there that most women at the time would never have just, right. like, left behind if they mm -hmm. were going on a trip. Um and Holmes at the time, when concerns were raised by other people that lived in the building, um, he had said that Julia had left suddenly because he, she received a telegram that her sister was dying. But it was really suspicious because even so, no woman would leave suddenly without at least taking some of her personal shit. Like, mm. throw some shit in a bag and go if you're right. in that much of a hurry. But right. it's like she didn't take anything. Um, now... Uh, now she's gone, and all this time, over the next 11 months, Ned is sending money to Julia and Pearl to support them, right? Because it's still his child. He's sending essentially child support to right. Julia for 11 months. So, But he doesn't know she's gone. He does not know she's gone. And Holmes is writing letters to Ned as if Pearl and Julia are still there and That's still alive. Up. And Holmes is... So she's gone, but is the baby gone too? Stay tuned. So Holmes is pocketing the money in of the course. meantime. Now, later, Holmes stated this is what happened. First, he stated that he killed them accidentally. Um, he stated that he had attempted to put Pearl to sleep with some chloroform because what happened was Julia had gotten pregnant and Holmes was going to take her downstairs into the basement to do an abortion. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. And he attempted, what he said is that he attempted to put Pearl to sleep with some chloroform, but administered a fatal dose. Mm -hmm. And he then stated he subsequently gave a fatal dose of chloroform to Julia. And because he didn't, you know, he, she was pregnant. He didn't want to have to support, you know, Julia and Pearl and this new baby. Um, so he then stated after you know during his writings that the skeleton that he had sold to medical science and was no. stripped by one of his workers was julia's skeleton no so she would not be the last that he did that to but where's pearl so pearl was never accounted for Ugh. but he did admit to killing her and Later on, what we're going to talk about in part two is um, they eventually do search the murder castle and uncover some remains. And some of the remains that they found do look like a child that was around six years old, which is the age that Pearl would have been. <sighs> All right. I hate him. Well, good news. And he's fucked up. He's very fucked up. And good news. We don't have to talk about him anymore for the rest of the night. Because part one is done. Yeah. <laughs> it's a weird way to stop. You're welcome. <sighs> Holmes, you jerk. Also, by the way, I got a lot of my info um, from this great book, um, The Devil in the White City, and it's by Eric Larson. And it's actually getting a adaptation to, like, book to movie adaptation, or it was, mm. at least, from what I saw. Leo DiCaprio, directed by Martin Scorsese, is going to be a good one. Leo DiCaprio is going to play H.H. Holmes. Holmes. Yeah. And it also is nice because it really goes into the whole Jack the Ripper component 
Hmm. which is really interesting. So I highly recommend you read it if you want to get really more into depth in um, his background and the supposed murders and what was confirmed true, what was not confirmed true. It's all very interesting. Thank you for bringing this to light. You're welcome. I hope everyone enjoys it. I hope everyone has a good another 14 days until our next session's out. I know. Thank you all for listening and being supportive of our. Yeah, we really, really appreciate all your support, by the way. We love, we love you guys. All of you. Thank you for, and a lot of you reached out to us and gave us some well wishes and whatnot when we had our very disappointing 24 hours. God, of, that was what so heartbreaking. Oh, that was so the thank worst. you for that. And thank you for sticking with us. If you want to uh, keep in touch with us, you can follow us on Instagram at Medcrimes Podcast. You can tweet at us at Medcrimes PC. You can find us on Facebook by searching Medcrimes Podcast. Or if you wish to become a Patreon, you can visit www.patreon.com slash Medcrimes Podcast. Who the hell are you? I don't know. You can email us your crazy stories at medcrimes at gmail.com. Yeah, we want to hear from you. Yeah, we do. All right. Stay safe, y'all. Thank you.